a lecture 11 today, a solid state physics course. And uh, we're going to put what we learned about uh, real lattices, reciprocal lattices, um, and um, how to calculate energy eigenstates of electrons in these lattices to use today as we're going to consider uh, band structures of uh, various materials uh, now uh, more or less for real. Right? So we will still fall back to our models, which are any model is a simplification. Uh, and it's important to know the assumptions made in the model and what are the simplifications uh, made in each model. But uh, even our models that we introduced already give us pretty good uh, results on the band structure given the crystal structure and we will see that today. Okay. Um, but first I need uh, to make a issue a correction with respect to last lecture. We were talking about block theorem and nearly free rectum model and I, and I was telling you about block and I said that it was Emmanuel Bloch who figured it out in 1929 or something that uh, if you have a periodic potential, then your solutions are these Bloch wave functions, which look a little bit like plane waves, but have this U, uh, periodic U component to them, right? So I, I was wrong. It was not Fel uh, Emmanuel Bloch. It was actually Felix Bloch. Uh, there, is a, there are some things similar between them and some things very different. Uh, they're both brilliant physicists. Uh, it's difficult to say who is greater, a greater physicist. Uh, but uh, Emmanuel Bloch could not exist in 1929. He was not born. <laughs> he is a, uh, a young uh, uh, physicist. He is an experimentalist, and he works on these cold atom <coughs> condensates and optical lattices, uh, which is perhaps why I misspoke, because I thought about those experiments. And uh, uh, funny enough, uh, if you look at his recent publications, you can find a paper like this, experimental reconstruction of Wilson lines in block bands. And here is him, Emmanuel Bloch. But the block bands he means here are from this guy. So they are connected at many levels, but they're two distinct people. And so I have to correct myself. OK, back to the band structures. Um, so uh, a quick recap. Um, we. Uh, first saw band structures of some kind in this toy model, which was the tight binding model for electrons, where we had an array. This was a one-dimensional tight binding model. Uh, so it had just an array of atoms. We can call it a crystal lattice uh, in one dimension. Um, and we said, OK, each atom comes with an orbital. In this case, actually, two orbitals per atom. So we have two bands here. Uh, and for the lowest band, the solution was this cosine function, um, which includes the parameters of the model. So j would be this hopping term between the orbitals. So the orbitals are the eigenstates of an electron bound to each atom, right? And j was hopping between them, so coupling between the orbitals. And E naught was the energy of the eigenstate associated with one atom. So if you sit on one atom, your energy is E naught, and there is the uh, energy scale J to hop to the next atom. So gave us this result, and uh, it has a, a lot of the features uh, of real band structures. So uh, first of all, uh, periodic structure. So this is a periodic function, this cosine function, with a period of the reciprocal lattice vector, 2 pi over A. That's the period. Uh, it has, you can have several bands, like I just mentioned. If you uh, have one alpha and one beta for one atom, it will give you two bands if you do two alpha, two beta, and so on, two orbitals per atom. Um, it also has these band gaps, right? It has these band gaps. And this is what is tends to be one of the most important things uh, in the band structure is these band gaps. So what we did uh, last week was the nearly free electron model. So approaching the same 
question from the opposite end. So starting not with eigenstates of electrons bound to atoms, but starting with free electrons, plane waves that travel through space, uh, those were the eigenstates. And then by using this perturbation theory, which is a neat piece of quantum mechanics that I explained briefly to you, uh, we found this result. So how did we get this result? Um, the blue line is the free electron spectrum. It's a parabola. So that's the dispersion relation of free electrons. And the dashed, the dotted black lines are the results from the nearly free electron model. So if you just focus on the black lines, uh, you see some of the same features. Um, first of all, you can see the gaps as well. And the gaps are in the same locations at the edges of the brilliant zone. So that seems to be generic between the two models. Um, then uh, if you look at the lowest band, it looks uh, uh, like a similar function, maybe not identical to the tight binding model, but it kind of looks like a, it might be a cosine, right? It uh, has a par parabola at the bottom, which a cosine would give you. Um, and it's also a periodic function. And you can also have multiple bands. So whenever... Uh, you cross into the next billion zone, and this band gap open, you can call this uh, the next band. So the two models agree. They approach things from different perspectives. And so the parameter that was giving us this gap was how strong the nearly free electron model potential is. So this periodic function um, V of x, which was a perturbation on top of free electrons. So the stronger this potential, the larger uh, was this gap. So the stronger our atoms were bound to uh, electrons, the stronger electrons were bound to the, to the lattice sites, the larger was the band gap here. And it's uh, actually also similar to the tight binding model in a sense that uh, this bandwidth Right? This bandwidth here was given by J. J is the coupling between lattice sites. So the larger the hopping, the larger the bandwidth, and the smaller is the uh, distance between the bands. So the band gap shrinks when the hopping is stronger. Band gap increases when the binding to the lattice sites is stronger. So even in this sense, the two models agree and uh, can probably be, uh, you know, can probably make a correspondence between them. Okay, so those are the two models I want you to think about as we consider uh, band structures uh, today. And uh, the nearly free electron model is what we will use. Actually, we'll use both. So really both. Okay. Um, some nomenclature and a reminder. Um, bands are like vessels, like, uh, like glasses. Uh, and electrons are like liquid that you can pour into them. And so you can fill a band with electrons. And if you have a situation like this where one band is completely full and then the next one up is completely empty, uh, situations like this, uh, we call the, the lowest filled band the valence band. Even if it's not completely filled but has a little bit left, that's still a valence band. And then the next band up is the conduction band. So we were going to use that a lot uh, this week. And today we are mostly going to fill the bands. We're going to fill the bands with electrons. Um, and so for, to continue this uh, reminder of the nomenclature, um, suppose you have, uh, now this is a tight binding model. It has J parameters here on the axis. So the bandwidth is 4J in the tight binding model. Uh, suppose it's made of uh, monovalent uh, atoms. So in this case, uh, each orbital uh, contributes one electron to the band structure. Right? And so you would imagine that the entire band, the first band, should be filled. However, it's not the case because
Why is this band only half filled? So each lattice side should contribute one electron, and there are n available k states here. So it should be completely filled, but it's half filled. What divides? Yeah, that's right. So because of the two spin states, right, for each k, you can have spin up and spin down. And so um, a monovalent material will result in a half-filled band all the time, most of the time. Okay? And so um, because of the Pauli principle, uh, all the states starting from the lowest energy state will be occupied tightly, at least at zero temperature, at the, the lowest temperature we can reach. Uh, in any case, we will be close to this situation where um, there is a certain energy level below which all states are filled, and above that level, states are empty. And that is called the Fermi energy. Right? And this situation is chosen to be zero. Fermi energy is zero in this, in this model. All right, so we talked about all these things before. Um, Fermi energy is an important uh, energy. Uh, also, the number the uh, subset of k vectors for which electrons are right at the uh, Fermi level is an important uh, concept, and that's called the Fermi surface. So points in k uh, that separate the field and the unfilled region, or points in k where uh, electrons have exactly the Fermi energy. Uh, so in this case, there are just two such points. There is one here. And there is one here. So that's not much of a surface, of course, but that's because we're in one dimension. So in two dimensions, uh, we will have some kind of Fermi contours. And in three dimensions, these will be really Fermi surfaces. And most materials are three-dimensional. And so Fermi surface is the, the standard term for, for all dimensions, even though it's only a surface in three dimensions. OK. Uh, now, what's the importance of uh, Fermi surface? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, well, we remember that um, in this kind of a half-field band where we can define a Fermi surface, uh, we have states which are uh, at infinitely larger energies than the Fermi energy. We have available states, empty states. And therefore, it means we can fill these states with electrons. So we can take some electrons from here and put them here. Or we can take some electrons from the left and put them on the right. And this, in particular, corresponds to a state with electrical current. So in this case, this monovalent material will generate an electrical current. So Fermi, when you have a Fermi surface, typically means you can have conduction, conduction of electricity, conduction of heat by electrons as well. Electrons. These electrons, displaced ones, will also carry heat. Okay, so this is the importance of a Fermi surface. Has has other uh, implications as well, but I think this is uh, enough of a motivation to study them. And um, importantly, a uh, situation like this, we don't talk about Fermi surfaces. Uh, uh, or we can say that the Fermi surface is right at the brilliant zone edge, the band is completely filled. Uh, and uh, this is actually much less interesting because um, here the band is filled and there is no state just at a tiny energy above uh, the Fermi energy. Uh, you have to go to the higher band. You have to cross this gap. You have to cross this gap energy in order to uh, add an electron. Uh, at a slightly higher k, for example. Uh, and that means that uh, there will be almost never any current in this situation, except for some exotic uh, situations. And so this corresponds to insulators, uh, to some extent, to semiconductors, um, uh, situations like this. How do you get a, a filled band? You can have a divalent material, right? If each atom contributes two electrons, 
Uh, then with one electron per atom, remember you go to half, with two electrons per atom, you go and you fill the lowest band completely. Okay. Of course, real materials can have many more electrons, but what counts is the, the, upper, the upper orbitals, most of them. Okay. Now uh, let's go to higher dimensions. Uh, this is um, a band structure for a tight binding model, but in two dimensions. So imagine you have a two-dimensional array of atoms and you can hop in X, you can also hop in Y. It's the same parameter J to hop in X and in Y. That's why these two cosine functions uh, have the same J in front of them. It's the same uh, epsilon naught to be on one side. Uh, and uh, so this is a very straightforward extension uh, from one dimension to two dimensions. The total energy, uh, the energy band, the vessel, which we're going to fill with electrons, uh, is just a sum of two one-dimensional situations, one along x with kxa and one along y with ky. And you can imagine that in three dimensions, it is also something like this. Okay? But this is for a simple square lattice, uh, this is what we get. So it is a landscape that has a cosine along x and a cosine along y. It produces this kind of a potential. This is a 3D plot of it. So this is how it looks uh, from above. Uh, looking uh, down at this potential, uh, color represents the height of the potential, um, a bit like the C. So the deep blue is the bottom of the potential, the lowest point. And you can see that in the center of the first brilliant zone, this is the first brilliant zone for a square lattice. It's a square. Uh, right? For a more complicated lattice, it could be something else. But for a square lattice, it's a square. Uh, so close to the center, all the colors go uh, in concentric circles. You have a dark blue circle, lighter blue circle, lighter and lighter, lighter and lighter. And, but uh, close to the edges of the brilliant zone, where here the yellow and the blue interchange. And so you have, especially the corners of the brilliant zone, the pi A and the pi A points are lifted up higher than these uh, midpoints. So the, the potential is lifted by the, by the ends, like you can see in 3D. OK, so now what are the consequences of this if you have monovalent materials versus divalent materials, right? For monovalent materials, we'll fill half the band. For divalent materials, we, fill, we have enough electrons to fill the entire uh, first bullion zone. So this is what you're going to get for a monovalent uh, material, where each lattice site contributes a single electron to the band structure. So you fill with a little bit of volume corresponding to a single electron. Uh, yeah, so uh, you are going to go to about halfway out. And you're going to be constrained to this part in the middle, which is fairly symmetric. So to simplify things, you will just have a Fermi surface, Fermi contour, just a red line here is the Fermi surface, where inside everything is filled, which is pretty close or exactly like a perfect circle. And so this is no different from a free electron. Right? In fact, if you now think about the free electron model, this is a tight binding model here, but if you think about the free electron model, then at the bottom of the band, uh, you have this parabola, which deviates very little, or almost not, from a free electron situation. So if you just fill that part in the, in the bottom, that parabola, you're just going to have free electrons. And they are going to have a Fermi surface like that of free electrons. Uh, so electrons in free space would 
pack up all the case pay, all the momentum states uh, from the lowest momentum up and make a Fermi surface like in a Sommerfeld model, like in a free electron gas. So you have this free electron gas situation because uh, electrons are weakly bound to atoms uh, in this case for these chosen parameters. So what happens if electrons are stronger bound to atoms? So in the near the free electrons picture, we will increase the potential, the periodic potential. Or in this case, uh, here, we will play with the ratio of E, epsilon naught, and J. Well, we'll see that in a moment. But I'm going to start showing you also the 3D versions of these. And so just to. Uh, make a statement about 3D that behavior in 2D and 3D is very analogous. Uh, you just need to think about uh, Kx, Ky, Kz. And we're going to also start using the real crystal uh, structures like BCC, FCC. And we have to remember what the unit cells were in those. In those. But I'll remind you as we go along. So it will look conceptually like 2D, but it will be in 3D. So here is an example. And now we put in a real material, sodium, uh, BCC, uh, crystal lattice. And so the first brilliant zone looks like the Wigner's 8 cell of the FCC lattice. In any case, it's this uh, fairly complicated shape. But doesn't matter uh, because uh, sodium is a monovalent material. Uh, and so uh, each atom of sodium contributes one electron to this. And the various distortions of, uh, the, um, br uh, of the band structure happen in, in these regions here, closer to the boundaries of the brilliant zone, which is this shape. And we are not sensitive to them. The Fermi surface to which electrons are filled is almost a perfect circle. And this is the analog of that in 2D. So this actually is not a toy, it's not a game simulation. It is a real material, a real Fermi surface for a real uh, metal. It can look like a perfect ball. Uh, you will see in a moment that this is, situation is uh, not uh, something that is uh, very common. OK, so go back to the, to the two-dimensional toy world. Uh, and we're going to increase, uh, we're going to increase the strength of the potential. So the strength of the potential that couples electrons to uh, the atoms. And we are going to make the band gaps uh, larger. And we're going to uh, lift these regions up higher. We're going to lift them up higher. And uh, what's going to happen is that this uh, area with where the colors form these concentric circles is going to shrink. Uh, and already out here, it's going to look like a, a distorted, distorted shape. If I draw the equi energy contour here, it's going to look distorted. So I'm just playing with the parameters uh, of the tight binding uh, model in this case. And so then if you fill uh, this kind of band structure with electrons, uh, what you're going to have is rather than a circle, some electrons will see that they have a lower energy to be here rather than to be here. So they prefer to be here, and they go out of uh, this uh, empty pocket and go into the filled pocket. So rather than having a circle, we have a distortion. And this is an extreme case of distortion uh, where we reach the boundaries of the brilliant zone. So the energy is just simply lower in this region. And so electrons flow there rather than forming a perfect circle. So once again, this is a real uh, Fermi surface. Now it's lithium, very similar to sodium, but it's lithium. And uh, in this case, we have this 
uh, distorted shape. Uh, it is still uh, topologically the same shape. It's a continuous blob, but it's not a perfect sphere. It is. It has these protrusions. Uh, and the situation that corresponds to that in 2D would be something like this. So they don't quite reach to the brilliant zone boundary, these electrons. They almost fill up to those points at some k, uh, in some k directions, but certainly doesn't look like a circle. But this is still monovalent. Um, it is uh, also a BCC structure. So the same unit cell, just slightly different parameters for binding electrons to atoms. That's the only difference between lithium and sodium. Situation I highlighted to you a couple of slides ago also exists. Uh, so where uh, potential is distorted so from the uh, from the weakly bound potential that electrons reach just to the edges uh, of the brilliant zone and stop there. So the the C that just approached the the the, the front porch of your house, something like this. Um, so just stop here. There is a real uh, example of that. It's copper. In this case, copper is quite different from lithium and uh, sodium. It is in a different column of the periodic system. Uh, it uh, is a FCC structure. So you can see the different uh, unit cell here. It has the Wigner-Zeit cell of the BCC in real space is the uh, brilliant zone of the uh, FCC lattice. And looks like a, almost a circle, but it has these uh, um, dimples in it, uh, like craters. And uh, these mean that the Fermi uh, surface just reaches the, uh, the boundaries of the brilliant zone. So if we draw a second uh, unit cell here, it will go smoothly into that, uh, into that. So it's a kind of a, sometimes called an open Fermi surface. It's an open Fermi surface. So these are all um, uh, obtained from, uh, by playing with the strength of the potential. However, all of these are monovalent, so uh, uh, each uh, atom contributes one. Uh, and uh, for monovalent, there is some kind of an argument based on basically volume conservation. So uh, if you have monovalent materials, then uh, the volume of this filled uh, region is smaller than the volume of the first brilliant zone. In this simple weakly coupled case, it's one half. Uh, and that means that there will always be some Fermi surface inside the first brilliant zone. So you, you cannot have it completely filled everywhere. You don't have enough electrons for that. There will always be somewhere a boundary between filled states and empty states inside the first brilliant zone. And so they will all be metals. Uh, for this reason. Uh, so this is just a statement of that. The blue region is smaller area than the white region in the black square. That's as simple as that. OK, now um, look, we're going to look a little bit at the real divalent materials. Uh, nominally, should be insulating should have field bands, right? Remember the recap from the beginning of the lecture? You have two electrons per atom. That should fill up the lowest band. In practice, these kind of things are possible where due to the strong coupling, bands overlap. And in this case, uh, you will have two partially filled bands. And so you will have a Fermi surface. So let's look at this picture. We've seen it before. Um, on this axis, we can have the crystal lattice uh, parameter we we, or the atomic spacing. We can have interaction strength between electrons like J going in the opposite direction. So 
uh, J would go this way, A would go this way if we're talking about the tight binding model. Um, what will also go in this, this way is the V of X, this parameter in the nearly free electron model. So the stronger uh, electrons are bound to atoms, the weaker they interact, the weaker they hop, the lower the chance of bands overlapping. So here you can see on this side there is a large band gap between the two bands. So here is band number one, band number two, there is a huge band gap between them. So of course in this situation we're just going to fill band number one completely and uh, band number two will be completely empty. So this is what happens on this side uh, for divalent materials where we have two electrons per atom. Uh, now as we couple the ele uh, electrons, the orbitals stronger and stronger, uh, or if we go towards the almost a free electron, uh, the bandwidth grows, right? In the tight binding, this was 4J. So the bandwidth grows with, with J. J increases this way. These atoms move closer and closer. Um, and uh, there can be a situation where bands overlap, like here, for example. So what we're going to do in this case, well, we, we could have a situation like this where bands uh, are overlapping in energy, meaning that uh, there are positions in energy with two bands at the same energy. And uh, our Fermi level was supposed to be here at the top of the lowest band, but clearly you have these extra states below that level, so electrons are going to go to that. And so what you might, may end up having a Fermi level here with all of these states filled in the second band and all of these states filled in the first band. So you have two partially filled bands uh, and now the question is what the Fermi surface of this kind of situation is supposed to look like. Well, this is, uh, this is basically what happens. Um, let's look at the picture in the upper left. Uh, we have now uh, a toy model uh, with a simple two-dimensional square lattice again. And the black square was the first brilliant zone volume area size. Uh, and now the circle, the blue circle, has the exact same volume, has the exact same area in this case. So we have enough electrons to fill completely the black, the black square. And if we reduce J or uh, couple very strongly atoms to the cores, to the, uh, to the lattice sites, uh, sorry, a couple electrons to the lattice sites. Uh, then we're going to drop the corners in the cosinusoidal potential, and we're going to fill completely and perfectly uh, the first brilliant zone. And this corresponds to the situation of an insulator, because this one lowest band is completely filled. The second one is completely empty. So this happens when electrons don't hop or when they're strongly bound to atoms. Now, if we have a strong coupling between sites, like in a, a nearly free electron model, weak potential, uh, we're going to have the following situation. Uh, these protruding pieces here that go outside of the first brilliant zone, they're going to be in the second brilliant zone. They can fold, fold back right in the reduced zone scheme. They're going to be in the second band. They're going to live in the second band. So this will correspond to the second band. And so the situation will be like this. Uh, maybe it won't be a perfect circle. Maybe we're going to have uh, some electrons that, pref that spill over, go onto your porch, right, where you're standing in, the, in front of your house, go inside the living room a little bit, and they, they're going to form these pockets here outside of the first brilliant zone. Uh, but there will be the equal area empty pockets in the corners where, where the band structure is lifted by the corners, those yellow corners in the two-dimensional plots. Uh, those will be empty. 
So this is going beyond uh, what we had before. Uh, and so the lowest band will have this kind of a uh, occupation in it. Uh, and there will be a Fermi surface corresponding to these, these parts. In these parts, we have states that lie just above the field states. We have available states. Electrons can be in there with some excitation, thermal or uh, absorb a photon or uh, due to some extra chemical potential in the, uh, in the electrical experiment in a, in a lead. Uh, so these will form a Fermi surface. Now in the, in the second band, we're going to have uh, these extra pockets, and they're going to also form a Fermi surface in the second band, which looks like this. So there will be a Fermi surface in two bands. And so this is, a, again, an example that illustrates that. That's a real uh, band structure, real Fermi surface for calcium. A divalent material, but it is a metal. Calcium is a metal. Uh, and that's because there are states available here. So um, let's look at the colors here. The first brilliant zone is uh, uh, this shape. It's the uh, Wigner's 8 cell of the BCC lattice. So it's a complicated shape. You're already a little bit used to these shapes by now. Uh, and um, Inside the first band, we have uh, these yellow colors are the areas where uh, you have the Fermi surface, meaning that just above the yellow regions, you have these uh, available states. And they tend to be uh, in the corners of this shape. right? So the corners uh, here are all empty, unoccupied. The electrons below them uh, fill tightly all the states. And now these empty uh, circles uh, are where it spills over to the second band where you have uh, these missing circles are misplaced into the second band, right? So this, this emptiness, you can see it uh, showing up in the second band uh, where those electrons now live, the ones that spilled over here. And the black just means that it's on the opposite side, on the opposite face of the surface. So that's the black color. Okay, so this is basically this situation. So it's a divalent material. Nevertheless, it's still conducting. What determines if it's a conductor or an insulator? That's determined by the nature of atoms, how strongly they're coupled, what is the atomic spacing. So you put all these parameters into the model, and you can predict what the Fermi surface is going to look like for each element. So this is just a... I zoom in to the same structure. You can see in more clearly the empty regions here. And this is mostly empty. It just, uh, these, um, these orange um, areas are facing uh, into, the, into the shape, into this decahedron uh, or whatever this shape is. So they are, this is a complicated shape like this, and they are hanging inside of it. And so the one that we're looking at is black because it's, it's inside. Right. So people have done it for pretty much the entire periodic system. Uh, the ones that are missing uh, perhaps uh, just simply don't have the Fermi surface. They're insulating. Uh, but uh, this is uh, a periodic system of Fermi surfaces. And of course, you know, periodic system, the, the chemical one from Mendeleev, uh, talks about single atoms. And here, we also say, ask each atom, which crystal structure does it form? What is its crystal constant? What is the atomic spacing? What, uh, and, and then we take into account the chemistry of the atom, so the valence and the, which orbitals are occupied. And we can produce these Fermi surfaces using uh, the models that we know, the ones that I introduced to you. So for example, this one uh, uses tight binding parameters 
from a reference, from a reference from uh, 1986. So there is a book with uh, tight binding parameters for each crystallite, for each material, that if you run a tight binding calculation would give you the correct uh, Fermi surface that was maybe confirmed by some experiments. Uh, you can extract the tight binding parameters from these measurements. And so you get this kind of a, a periodic system. Uh, now, the ones we looked at are here. Those are the first ones that I, I showed you, and copper is here. Uh, and those are the, you can see they are the simplest looking ones, sort of uh, ball type shapes or a bit of distorted ball, um, ball type shapes. But the other ones, oh my god, look at them, right? They're pretty, pretty complicated. Um, now, um, there are some things here worth pointing out uh, in some detail. We will look at the red regions uh, up close in a moment, but just in this global one, uh, ferromagnets, we're going to talk about them later in, the, later in the course, and ferromagnetism is not explained very well by just the band structure, but you can see how complicated the Fermi surfaces are. And then these alternate structures, right? So uh, this one, uh, corresponds to, you know, you take the same uh, uh, atom and then say, oh, what if it was not FCC but BCC, right? And you can redo the calculation. And so some, some elements can exist in different uh, lattices. So for so some of them it's possible, maybe under pressure or uh, other situations, um, this is possible. And so the band structure will also change and can change quite a bit depending on the crystal structure for the same uh, element. So the, these have indices like FCC, uh, BCC. So for example, this one is uh, manganese FCC. And this manganese here will, is probably BCC. So, so uh, you know, these two little cartoons look quite different uh, from each other. Okay, um, so this is the left side of the periodic table, the first group and the second, and this is where copper is on the right side, those red uh, framed uh, segments. Uh, and you can see that uh, this first column is really, really, uh, really simple compared to uh, everything else. Uh, the Fermi surface is in the first brilliant zone entirely. Uh, it's somewhat distorted for some of the elements, uh, but look at these, this uh, uh, potassium is, com is just perfect, perfect circle. Um, and, cop and these guys have these open Fermi surfaces with, uh, uh, with these blobs here. Um, now, um, Material like magnesium is supposed to be an insulator. It's a divalent system. Uh, however, because of the band parameters, bands overlap in magnesium, and you have this complicated uh, Fermi surface, what this picture represents is the colors correspond to different bands. So you have this purple color uh, in the lowest band, and then some spillover into the second band, um, which uh, is in this uh, blue cyan color. Uh, so this, this fills up the holes in the, in the purple, because these are the two, two bands that are relevant here. And so because of this, as mag uh, magnesium becomes a, uh, a metal, And you can see uh, here, for these elements, uh, if I read these colors correctly, I see three different colors. So it could be that this I did not uh, check for this lecture. But if I read this uh, based on the other things, it, it looks like the Fermi uh, level exists in three different bands. There are empty and filled states in three uh, different bands in these materials.
Okay, so this just uh, goes uh, over what I already just said. Uh, because of spin, uh, these have half-filled Fermi surfaces. These are supposed to be fully filled, but uh, that's not the case. Uh, and due to band overlap, we have partially filled and uh, empty bands. Now, um, there are elements and very important ones for which um, this simple logic of being uh, divalent, or in this case, the valence is 4 for silicon and germanium, it works. So uh, you have, in silicon or germanium, you have completely filled bands, and then a gap, and then empty bands. So just like it's supposed to be, uh, band structure theory works very well for silicon and germanium. Uh, however, in these materials, because the band gap is relatively small, uh, they are semiconductors, and so we are going to introduce this week a lot of concepts related just to semiconductors because they're very important materials, um, which are based on the band structure, but uh, consider other effects that occur in materials such as impurities. So not pure crystals, but crystals that have some uh, substitute atoms. Nevertheless, uh, this is a calculation for silicon. This is the band structure. I uh, may have already showed it to you before. So it's an FCC lattice with a two atom basis. So you have an atom uh, at each corner and each face of the FCC lattice and then misplaced by one quarter, one quarter, one quarter. From that you have one more silicon. So this is the FCC lattice with a basis of two atoms. So two atoms per unit cell, each of them has a valence of four. That's group four, elements of group four in the periodic table. Uh, so you have eight electrons to play with per unit cell. So to occupy the first brilliant zone, you have eight electrons. Now if you count the bands, there's one, two, three, four. There are four bands, then there is a gap. There is this gap. And so what is going to happen with this material uh, is that all the bands below the gap will be filled, and all the bands above the gap will be empty. Now, just uh, a an interesting wrinkle on the band structure theory that I wanted to introduce. Uh, looks fairly complicated, right, these bands. And so uh, we're not going to calculate all of them. Uh, looks like they overlap and go about. And this is, remember, this is a plot in the 3D. So we are going from between points in reciprocal space, from gamma to k to x to l. So in different directions, these are cuts. Uh, through this three-dimensional band structure, which can be quite complicated. Uh, but uh, we can still see some traces of the models that we use to calculate this in this structure. So for example, here's for the lowest band, you have a parabola. And this is just from the nearly free electron model. So the, for this lowest band, uh, the calculation of the nearly free electron model will give you a band very similar to this. Uh, and, and this, uh, remember the, how wide the parabola opens, we, that's like the mass of the electron, and so that is very close to the free electron mass uh, as well. And now here at the brillion zone edge, so L point is at the brillion zone edge, uh, we have a band gap. We have a band gap just like in the nearly free electron model, we have a gap between the bands. Um, it's not the important band, that's a gap that separates empty from filled. It's somewhere beneath, buried beneath the, the filled bands, but uh, it is uh, the same as in the nearly free electron model. Now, actually going the other way to the X point, we don't have this uh, a gap there, but that's because um, along that direction going from uh, going to the X point, 
uh, due to this particular crystal structure, there is a cancellation in the perturbation theory, and uh, the, the eigenstates don't couple there. So there's just a unique to this, to this particular band structure, so these things can also happen. And so band structure theory is uh, not the most trivial thing. This is a large departure from a simple square lattice in 2D. Uh, these bands are the real thing. Um, but uh, we can recognize some of the elements here. So uh, this is the same picture uh, drawn uh, in a slightly different, with slightly different line cuts, but still we have four bands which are filled, and these upper ones here, we're going to call them the valence band. So this upper band is the valence band. Uh, these ones here, that's the conduction band. The highest unfilled band is the conduction band. Uh, and so now uh, these three-dimensional pictures are how it looks, how the, um, uh, the filled states look in these different bands. So actually, uh, valence bands, uh, there, are, there are a couple of them. There is a degeneracy in the orange uh, circle in the plot. So there are two of them, and they're called uh, light and heavy, L and H, uh, because... Who can guess why they're called light and heavy? So these two guys. Right. Uh, so the parab parabola is sharper in one case than in the other. So which one is light? Which one is heavy? This one is what? So we have uh, <laughs> b squared over 2m. As it gets sharper, is that right? the mass is smaller, right? So this one will be heavy, right? This one will be light, right? Make sense? Yeah? All right. Uh, so those are, um, those are actually completely filled. And uh, so they just fills up this shape. Uh, here, but look at the conduction band. So, so you have uh, these six pockets, and uh, they are perfectly symmetric like this. Uh, an electron can be in either one, of, in either any, sorry, I cannot say either, any of these six pockets. Uh, and so uh, these pockets are actually labeled separately. They are called valleys. So when, the, when it looks like this, uh, that means valleys, and uh, they originate from uh, these minima in the conduction band. These minima here give you these pockets, but if you go in all three dimensions, there will be six of these pockets at exactly the same energy, perfectly symmetric, in different directions in this uh, brilliant zone. Uh, and uh, so uh, people say that this band structure has a valley degeneracy. So. If you think about silicon, uh, which is uh, something that you know, powers our uh, electronics here, uh, if you think about silicon as a free electron gas, uh, think back to Sommerfeld, uh, there is this important wrinkle on that, is that it is like six free electron gases living together in one band structure. So there, there, are, uh, there are these valleys that that coexist there, and the sort of uh, electrons in these pockets uh, all coexist, but they don't form one Fermi C, uh, but they can all be occupied or deoccupied and so on. So this is an important uh, wrinkle for silicon. Oops. Now, what does the band theory not do? doesn't deal very well with interactions between electrons. So uh, the potential that we put in the uh, nearly free electron model is a potential of interaction between the lattice 
and an electron. And uh, this potential is between one electron and the lattice. So it's a periodic potential in which we put one electron. And so the eigenstates that we get in this situation are the eigenstates of single electrons in this kind of potential. And then what we do is we just apply a Pauli principle and say that there should be one electron per quantum state, including spin, there are two electrons per orbital state. Uh, and the same applies to the tight binding model. So we start in the tight binding model with uh, uh, atomic orbitals. Those are eigenfunctions func of electrons orbiting atoms, so individual electrons. But there are effects where interactions between electrons play a role. And so what are the interactions between electrons? Uh, well, uh, it could be a Coulomb interaction. For example, two electrons can attract, can repel. Uh, if they attract, it gives you superconductivity. I'll tell you how that happens uh, later in the course, how two electrons can attract. Uh, but basically, um, in the case of superconductivity, uh, people draw these kind of diagrams. Two electrons uh, scatter off each other, and they exchange a phonon. So one electron goes through the lattice, launches a vibration in the lattice. The other one absorbs it, and their trajectories are deformed. That effectively binds these two electrons together, uh, makes an attractive potential. And so this is a completely an interaction effect between two electrons. Uh, and you can see how this uh, is completely not included in the tight binding or the nearly free electron models that we considered. These kind of processes are not included. Now, MOT insulators, I mentioned them to you a few lectures ago. So this is a situation where a monovalent material can be an insulator. So uh, you have lattice sites, and each contributes one electron to our band structure. And so we're supposed to have a half-filled band. And I told you there should be a Fermi surface, and uh, it should be a metal. So there should be a Fermi surface inside the first Boolean zone. However, if either electrons are too tightly bound to these atoms or they repel each other, and so it costs uh, too much energy for two of them to be on one site, if this situation is not allowed, then there cannot be electrical current in this uh, situation because each of them will just have one electron sitting on each site and there is no possibility for creating an empty site and a doubly occupied site, which is the only way that current can travel, electri electrical charge can travel through this system. And so that's called a MOT insulator. And this is not explained by the band uh, theory. Now, magnetism, this is something that concerns spin. Uh, and in this case, what often happens is uh, if I draw the band structure for spin up going this way, and for spin down going that way, uh, there might be a displacement like this. Uh, so this is a, just a parabolic band, but only looking at uh, electrons with spin up. And in, in this direction, I'm plotting a parabolic band looking at electrons with spin down. And the band bottoms are a different energy. However, electrons can flip their spins. They can have spin up or spin down. And so they're going to occupy this band structure to some Fermi level. And as a result, we might have actually more spin down electrons in this case than spin up electrons. And so this is uh, one example of uh, magnetism. And so to, to include this, you need to include some kind of interactions that offset the bands for spin up and spin down. We're going to do that in a few weeks, um, but we cannot explain it at this moment. So I think it's very useful to keep these things in mind, uh, the limitations on the band theory. So band theory provides you a description of a vessel, um, and then you can fill it with an electron liquid. But also this liquid is not just a simple liquid. This liquid can start playing games with itself and generate these interesting effects inside the vessel.
OK. So uh, however, what the band theory does really well is explain uh, optical properties of solids. And so this is, a, this is a great success of the band theory. And so we are going to talk about, about those and how it relates to being a metal insulator, uh, a semiconductor, and so on. And so we are going to talk about uh, absorption, transmission, reflection of light by materials. But an important uh, point is that we're not going to look at diffraction like we did with x-rays. We are going to consider what happens if electrons absorb a photon, for example, and go to a higher energy level inside the material. These kind of processes is what we're going to look at. So not uh, plane waves being distorted by the crystal and uh, diffracting uh, in, in scattering, uh, but uh, what the band structure can teach us about uh, optical properties. And it turns out it determines a whole lot about optical properties of materials. Uh, first, uh, a refresher for you guys on the Maxwell's rainbow. So this is the, how we subdivide the electromagnetic spectrum uh, of radiation. Uh, the numbers here at the top are uh, wavelength. And the numbers at the bottom are frequency. Uh, and so, of course, as the wavelength gets larger, frequency gets lower because all these waves travel with the speed of light. Uh, and the important regions are, uh, for today's discussion, are around here. Uh, and most notably in the center is what we can see with our eyes, uh, which uh, spans in energy the interval from 1.7 eV for the red, or the infrared, begins at 1.7 eV. And 3.1 eV, so that is a pretty narrow range. But for us, this is uh, very important because our eyes can see in this range. Our devices and our instruments can see infrared and UV and even x-rays. As we saw, we have the x-ray detectors. And we certainly can pick up radios with our radios. So <laughs> we have devices uh, that go in this full range. Uh, but uh, what gives us colors is this uh, very narrow, very narrow energy range. And so um, with that in mind, we are going to um, make a definition for band insulators, uh, what's called band insulators, to distinguish it from things like mod insulator, which I just showed you, which is supposed to be a conductor, actually, but is not a conductor because of this. Uh, one atom stuck to each, uh, one electron stuck to each atom situation. So band insulators are situa uh, situations where a valence band is completely filled, conduction band is completely uh, empty. Uh, but we are going to uh, say that we have an insulator when the band gap is greater than this 3.2 eV. So this coincides uh, with uh, our cutoff that we can see at highest energy. So with the violet cutoff of our vision, we cannot see photons with energy larger than this. And therefore, uh, such band insulators with this gap will not be actually, uh, will not have any color, will not absorb any light, will be transparent to the light that we see. So these band insulators will be transparent. And so some examples are diamond, is transparent, we all know this. Uh, glass, glass or quartz, uh, silicon dioxide, aluminum oxide is uh, alumina or sapphire is one of the forms, uh, is completely transparent. Um, now, for materials which have a smaller band gap than this, smaller gap separating the, so we're talking about this gap here. For, for smaller gap, they will absorb some of the photons that we can also see with our eyes. Uh, and that will give them color, pretty much. Right? That will give them color. Okay. 
Uh, now, if their band gap is smaller than 1.7, they will absorb the entire light, right? So if this band gap is, uh, let's say, 1.1 or something like this, which is the case for some of these semiconductors, then any photon of visible light uh, from 1.7 to 3.1 will be able to take a particle from here and shoot it somewhere into the conduction band where the states are available uh, and therefore can be absorbed as possible. So if you have a, a photon with an energy smaller than the band gap, then all the states here are filled and so if you start with the highest unfilled state, you cannot reach across the band gap and so that photon will not be absorbed and it will go through and so the material will be transparent to that photon. Okay. It's now clear what I mean by transparent versus not transparent, absorbing. So you have to exceed the band gap to get to an available state in the conduction band. So these crystals have different colors and we can now understand why? Based on their, just based on their band gap. Uh, so, for example, this one, cinnabar. Sounds like a cinnamon bar. I don't know. But it's not, not so tasty, mercury <laughs> sulfide. But the gap is 2 electron volts. So, the gap is 2 electron volts, so it puts us right here. It means that all the photons here can be absorbed. They all have... Sorry, all the photons here can be absorbed, right? <laughs> and all the photons uh, on the red side go through. So all the photons higher than the band gap get absorbed, and these go through. And that's why it has this um, deep red color. Uh, if we go to this one, the band gap is a little larger. So we have to include this yellow and a bit of green even into the uh, photons that go through, only the photons on the blue and violet don't make it. And so it shifts in the orangey direction, shifts in the orangey direction in its color. You have to average all these wavelengths to figure out what color it's supposed to have, but this is how it works. And then uh, even higher band gap, sulfur 2.6, uh, shifts more towards yellow, so you just average these and you get the color uh, that you're going to get. So sulfur uh, includes even more, so all of these will be transmitted and only the, the deep blue and the violet will uh, be absorbed by sulfur because of its band gap. Uh, and therefore it has this uh, yellow color. So we just pretty much explained colors of things. Um, of course, um, the situation is um, more complicated. First of all, let me tell you what happens for uh, metals. Uh, so in the case of metals, uh, we don't have this uh, band gap, right? So in the case of metals, so metals, We have Fermi level in the middle of the gap, and so uh, any any tiny uh, energy photon, a microwave photon, uh, a radio frequency photon, can be absorbed by a metal, and that's why metals have these uh, shiny surfaces. Uh, and um, another uh, thing that can happen and happens very often is the situation of an indirect band gap. Uh, so we don't look at the metal. We look at a semiconductor, but um, bands are misplaced like this. So this axis is some kind of a cut in K space. Right? Uh, and the maximum of the valence band is here the minimum of the conduction band is here. Now, uh, you would say that the minimum energy photon that can be absorbed here 
is just given by this uh, gap. But it's not so easy because in order to get from here to here, a photon needs to have crystal momentum. You need to change the K of this electron. And uh, photons don't have this. They don't, they don't have uh, uh, crystal momentum. And so uh, these kind of indirect transitions are very, very difficult. Pretty much you, they are possible, but you have to combine it with some other process, like uh, involving a, exciting a phonon, uh, something else, so their probability is dramatically suppressed. So the first um, energy where you're going to have uh, strong absorption by the material is when you have this direct transition, which is just at the same K without changing the uh, crystal momentum, uh, you can just absorb a photon. So this uh, actually is a very, very frequent situation. You see that it's the case, uh, for example, in uh, silicon. Um, so once again, this is the band structure of silicon that I just showed you. Here is the top of the valence band, but here is the lowest point in the conduction band. And so silicon has an indirect band gap. And uh, therefore, silicon is not used much in optoelectronics. It's used in electronics, where you build transistors, pass currents, and so on, but not in, for building optical devices, such as lasers, for example. Uh, so this laser, uh, this is not a laser pointer, but laser pointers have other materials working in them, also semiconductors, but not silicon, because of this problem with the indirect band gap. So if you look at the absorption of silicon, uh, this is a real experimental data. Uh, looks like a, not a very dramatic curve, but you should uh, pay attention to this axis. This is a log, log scale. And so each uh, tick is a decade, a factor of 10. Uh, and this is what happens. As you decrease the wavelength, you increase the energy. And so at some point around here, you hit the energy of the indirect gap, so the smallest distance between the valence and conduction band for any k, which doesn't happen at the same k. And so this is an indirect transition. And so there is a, a little bump here, uh, a little increase in uh, absorption of photons at that frequency. And then once you hit the direct gap, which is at much higher energy than the indirect gap, uh, once you hit that, you get about a factor of 10. You go over a decade uh, in this plot, you get a factor of 10 increase. And so uh, if, I, if, you, if you were to plot this in, a, in real coordinates, it would look like there is a little tail, a little bump here, and then uh, increased absorption, increased absorption here. Um, where this tail comes from is uh, another story. And it's much more complicated than just a simple band structure. But obviously, some photons below the lowest, the smallest distance between the, uh, the two bands still get absorbed by this material. So there is some more uh, physics happening than uh, what I told you so far. It's a good moment to stop. And we'll pick it up uh, in a couple of days.